We begin with some breaking news. This is uh, not the sort of thing you expect to hear. You may find it shocking and certainly upsetting. I know I did. But here's the news. People are mad at me on the internet. They are upset. They're scandalized. They're calling me things like fascist and bigot. This is all, of course, making me feel quite bad about myself as someone who is so accustomed to receiving unanimous acclaim and adulation and agreement all the time everywhere I go. So I don't know how to deal with this. Let's back up uh, for a moment so you can understand the context. A few days ago, a leftist Twitter user, and I inferred his political leanings from the pride flag in his bio, posted a video expressing his awe over um, the airport in Singapore. This is Singapore's airport. And as you can see, it's a rather impressive sight. It looks like the uh, futuristic utopia in every sci-fi movie right before the robots start killing everyone. And I mean that in a good way. The waterfall there is particularly magnificent. Um, though in fairness, I have seen similar sights at like LAX. It's just that those waterfalls, waterfalls were overflowing toilets. Um, our airports in America are, are generally a, a different kind of experience from what you just saw there. Airports in the United States, they qualify as really nice if they have like a food court with a Chipotle and more than three electrical outlets in each terminal. So the bar is set a bit lower. Admiring Singapore, though, has become something of a, a trend online. Every so often, somebody, usually somebody on the left, will post a video uh, like the one you just saw or like this one, extolling Singapore, the city, for its uh, clean, green, eco-friendly approach. Watch. This place creates gardens and parks in the middle of its buildings. That's because in parts of Singapore, you're required to replace the land that you're building on with the same amount of greenery. So the greenery that is lost on the ground is replaced in the sky. Each building must have greenery that's equivalent to at least 100% of the land that it was built on. But some take it to the next level. This building has over 200% greenery for the land that it replaced. This is Park Royal and it's absolutely crazy how they managed to include greenery throughout the building. You can even go on a garden walk here. But all of this is not just done for a more beautiful look. There is a functional reason as well. See, buildings with more greenery end up using less electricity, produce less waste, and in general have a lower carbon footprint. You also improve the air quality and keep the temperatures cooler. This rooftop is over 50 stories high and it's pretty much entirely a garden. And the crazy part is that it's completely open to the public. This is a public area. Now, your mileage may vary a bit with the Jumanji aesthetic, where forests are growing inside and on top of all the buildings. The real point is that the city looks bright and clean and safe and not at all like a post-apocalyptic, zombie-infested hell hellscape, which sets it apart from our cities, which in so many cases look like some sort of horrifying mashup of The Walking Dead and The Wire. Um, like this, for example, what you see here is Philadelphia, but it could be a random street in nearly any major American city. There's a reason we don't have, you know, very many carefully manicured public parks located on the tops of our buildings, because if we did, there'd be almost immediately, you know, a drug addict passed out on every bench and a homeless guy taking a dump in every bush. The people who look with, with envious, lustful eyes at Singapore's cleanliness and general lack of fentanyl zombies and random street thugs assaulting pedestrians have every reason to be so covetous when you consider what our cities look like. But there's also a reason why Singapore looks like Singapore and Philadelphia looks like Philadelphia. There are many reasons, actually, and not all of them can or should be emulated. But in the tweet that got me into trouble, I mentioned one major factor that, to my mind, we should adopt. I tweeted this. Singapore is able to have nice things in part because they execute drug dealers by hanging and they arrest even petty vandals and thieves and beat them with a cane until they bleed. We don't have nice things because we aren't willing to do what is required to maintain them. Now that tweet has been viewed like 14 million times and 13.9 million of those views apparently came from people who were deeply offended by it on the right and left. But offended as they may be, the fact is that Singapore isn't plagued by property crime and violent crime nearly to the extent that our country is. In fact, their crime rates are among the lowest in the world because, in part, in large part, they harshly punish lawbreakers. As mentioned in the tweet, thieves, robbers, vandals, similar malcontents are subject to judicial caning. Drug offenders can be given the same treatment. 
and it's meted out to more serious criminals like uh, like rapists and people convicted of kidnapping. Often the corporal punishment will be paired with a prison sentence, which, depending on the crime, can be quite lengthy. We've heard a little bit actually about this punishment in Singapore and the methods that are used from Westerners who have made the mistake of committing the crimes in Singapore that everyone knows you aren't supposed to commit in Singapore. For instance, a couple of years ago, uh, the British media reported with great alarm about the story of a British national who got caught dealing drugs in Singapore, which again, everybody, even people who don't live in Singapore knows that Singapore is the last place where you go to deal drugs. That's what he did, and he received 20 years in prison to go along with a caning that was so severe that he couldn't sit down afterwards. He had trouble controlling his bowels because of how badly he was beaten. He reported um, that uh, the, the, the fear that he felt in having to wait in line while listening to the screams of other inmates as they received their punishments. He's in one room waiting. This is the way he described it. And they bring people in one by one, and they beat them with the cane, and you can hear them screaming in agony. And then they open the door, and it's your turn. Not a pleasant experience. Not one that I would ever want to experience myself. But he got off easy compared to other drug offenders, because if in Singapore you're caught with drugs over a certain amount, and it doesn't have to be all that much, 15 grams of heroin, 30 grams of cocaine, for example, you are automatically charged with uh, trafficking, drug trafficking. It's automatically assumed that you have that because you're, you want to traffic drugs. And in Singapore, they simply do not tolerate drug trafficking at all. So if you're convicted of drug trafficking, you are automatically executed. It is a mandatory sentence. And they will dole out this most severe of punishments for you know, a number of crimes, not just drug trafficking. Of course, murder, terrorism, kidnapping uh, can also warrant that. And, and other serious crimes as well. And the executions are carried out usually swiftly. Death row inmates are given four days notice, not four decades, four days notice, before they're taken out, usually at dawn, and they are dispatched by hanging. Now, it's often said that studies prove that death penalty and other harsh pun punishments are not effective deterrents. That's what we hear all the time in this country. Oh, it doesn't, studies have proven, studies have proven it doesn't deter anything. Well, it seems to be working pretty well in Singapore, which, which in Singapore, they can make it through entire days. Okay, in fact, dozens of days in a year without any reported crimes at all. As a CNBC report marveled over, uh, mar marveled over a few years ago, Singapore is so safe that many stores don't have locks they don't lock their doors at night, and sometimes they don't even have doors or locks to begin with. If capital punishment lacks a deterrent element in our country, it's obviously because we hardly ever use it. It's not capital punishment itself that doesn't deter crime. It is the way that we go about it that lessens its deterrence factor. There have only been something like 1,500 total executions in our entire country since the mid-1970s. And that number is decreasing all the time. It's like a small handful of people entire, across the entire country are executed in any given year. And on the extremely rare occasion that anybody is executed, it happens decades after the crime they committed, out of sight, out of mind for the public, and after hundreds of appeals. What this means is that criminals, they aren't deterred by it because they know they almost certainly won't receive that penalty. They know it won't happen to them no matter what they do. It's not that they aren't scared of the death penalty itself. Obviously, anybody would be scared of that. It's that they don't believe the court system will have the gumption to actually impose it on them. And in nearly every case, they're right. Now, when the death penalty or other harsh penalties are immediate and all but certain, it does have, unsurprisingly, a way of dissuading potential criminals. As it turns out, people do respond to incentives and disincentives. This is one of the basic realities of, of human psychology, is that every single person on the planet responds to incentives and disincentives. And the prospect of dangling at the end of a rope until you die is a rather powerful disincentive. It's not going to be 100% effective. Okay, there are people who will risk it, but most people won't. For the pettier criminals, the idea of being stripped naked and beaten so hard with a cane that the guy doing the beating has to take breaks to let his arm rest throughout your ordeal is also a rather powerful disincentive. 
Now, our system of dealing with thieves and vandals and those of that ilk is laughably ineffective because in these cases, too, the criminals aren't convinced that there will be any significant penalty. And if they do wind up with a short stint in prison, the experience is likely to only increase their street cred and give them an opportunity to spend time with and be influenced by criminals even worse than themselves. But an added element of extremely painful corporal punishment creates a profound disincentive so that even those unbothered by prison would be bothered by this. Caning is also, and it is meant to be, humiliating, degrading, emasculating, which means that the experience isn't going to enhance anybody's street cred. Okay, you're not going to get out of prison bragging about getting caned. Put another way, it's not the kind of thing that you can imagine a rapper, you know, boasting about in a song. And that's precisely why it's an effective form of punishment. In fact, maybe this is like the easiest way to think about this. When you're thinking about what sort of penalties should we have for criminals, think about it. If it's the kind of penalty you can imagine a rapper bragging about in a song that, you know, is becomes a big hit and is, and is, and is uh, streamed 100 million times on Spotify, if it's that kind of penalty then it's not a good penalty. Let's imagine penalties that they would be too embarrassed and too ashamed to brag about. Those are the good penalties. Those are the effective ones. Now, am I actually suggesting that we should adopt these Singapore-like draconian forms of justice here in the United States? Am I seriously advocating that? Yes, absolutely. Of course I am. Corporal punishment for convicted criminals That shouldn't even be controversial. Okay, that's actually obviously the correct thing to do. Both both obvious and effective and just. Those who cause damage to another person's body or livelihood or property should be made to experience the sort of physical suffering that might help them appreciate the seriousness of their crimes. Our current system is not impressing anyone with the seriousness of their crimes. That's what the punishment is supposed to do. We have it in our heads that, well, all forms of physical punishment are automatically cruel and unusual. I've heard this over and over again as in response to, to you know, this argument. Well, it's cruel and unusual punishment. As if it's just self-evident. You, you, can't, you can't simply assert that it's cruel and unusual to impose uh, the death penalty or corporal punishment. You have to explain why. It's, it's, you could call it cruel and unusual. In in what sense is it either of those things? I mean, these punishments certainly aren't unusual. On the contrary, they are probably the most usual sort of punishment imaginable from a historical perspective. And they aren't cruel because the person that they are inflicted on has chosen to act in a way that warrants it. It is not cruel to assign undesirable consequences to undesirable behavior. It is, on the contrary, the only way to maintain a civilized society. Criminals and lawbreakers must be made to suffer. If they aren't suffering, then it is not really a punishment. That's what a punishment is supposed to do. It's supposed to make you suffer. And so if we have a system where the, where the criminals are not suffering, then they're not being punished. And we are trying a system where we just actually don't punish people for committing crimes. Now, as for the death penalty for drug traffickers, this again to me seems obvious. They sell poison for profit, taking advantage of the most helpless and miserable among us, turning people and entire communities into zombified husks, slowly dying while these parasitic scumbags reap the rewards. They deserve to die for what they're doing to people, to our cities, to our country. They deserve to die for it. Fentanyl traffickers, okay, the people that are, those, those zombies that you saw in the, in the clip of Philadelphia that are, that are walking around hunched over, the people trafficking those drugs into our communities, they deserve to die. I, I, I can't understand the argument to the contrary. You actually tell me they don't deserve to die for doing that to people? Do we, do we need to keep them around? In what ways would we be harmed as a society if the people that are doing that, uh, if we are deprived of their presence? How are we harmed? How are we missing out? 
No, our nation would be a better, more hopeful, safer, and more livable place without them. Now, I'm not arguing that our country should emulate Singapore in every respect. There are certainly things about the country I don't like. And I'm not claiming that beating criminals and ha- hanging drug traffickers would on its own solve all of our problems. I acknowledge that Singapore has other advantages. They have a smaller, much more homogenous population, for one. And that helps it to build and maintain communities that aren't littered with used heroin needles and reeking constantly of weed and human urine, like our cities. But even so, there is a lesson we could learn here. The lesson is that civilization comes at a cost. If we have decided that nobody should have to pay that price, well then, we will no longer have civilization. We live free and comfortable and gentle lives. And so we imagine that everything is and should be comfortable and gentle all the way down. What we don't realize is that this freedom and comfort and gentleness has been maintained by tough men who are willing to do hard and sometimes ugly things. If we insist now that those things must not be done anymore because they interfere with our comfortable illusions, then pretty soon we will no longer have the comfort or the freedom. We are are surrendering our society to its worst and most predatory factions because we're too squeamish to stand up to them, to impose our will over them, and to force them to live like civilized human beings, which is what you're supposed to do with criminals. You stand up to them, you impose your will on them, you force them to behave, you don't give them an option. It's not putting them in jail for, let's hope they reform. Let's hope they see the error in their ways and that they choose of their own free will to be better people. No, we don't sit around waiting for that while, you know, our children are getting murdered in the street. We don't sit around waiting for it. We say, we're not giving you an option. And if your crimes are bad enough, we're not going to worry about, uh, about reforming you because you're done. There's no second strike. In other words, uh, these days we wish to have a civilization without justice. Because justice is too harsh a thing for us to stomach. We say no to justice, which means we say no to civilization. Which means that rather than forcing the lawless dregs of humanity to pay the price, we all have to pay it instead. That'll do it for this portion of the show. As we move over to the members block, hope to see you there. If not, talk to you tomorrow. Godspeed.